Hey guys, I'm back from my somewhat prolonged absence and I do apologize for that. This has been a particularly busy summer for me up until this point, but I'm hoping to reclaim a little bit more time to make some YouTube videos. Today, I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about my experience with Antergos uh, running on the uh, Triton I got from Entraware. Now, the reason I'm doing this as a, uh, as a sort of in-person style of video rather than doing a screencast type of video is because I wasn't actually able to get the screencast software working either simple screen recorder or OBS working on this laptop and um, and I thought rather than just uh, put the video off another day I've been away for long enough as it is I thought I might just give you the rundown in person now I know many of you guys prefer to have a bit of a screencast and I'll put up some screenshots at the beginning of this video just to uh, give you an idea about what um, what my desktop looks like I really haven't changed it that much it comes with the default new mix style theme which is pretty pretty nice looking although I do have to say the the size of the title bars in most of those gnome 3 applications under numix is ju is just huge um the triton laptop comes with a 1366 by 768 display and that's not really that high a resolution so screen real estate particularly vertical screen real estate is um you know is is, is at a premium and um also, uh, with the GNOME desktop, now I was a really big fan of the GNOME desktop going into uh, using Antergos, but I gotta say, running it on a lower end entry level laptop has made me see some of the cracks in it, and uh, it really does hit home when people say that it is a bit of a resource hog. You do often find yourself thinking, well, yeah, GNOME is doing the job here, but it's not doing the job better than XFCE, it's not doing the job better than Mate, it's not doing the job better than a pretty slim down KDE install. Like it is quite a bulky um, desktop environment. And on top of that, it does use some quirky paradigms that, um, you know, and, and to be honest, when it comes to user interface, I'm not the person to ask. I use almost every user interface under the sun just in the purposes of building this channel. So I don't really have an idea about what is an instinctive place to put various buttons or what have you. But I do get from feedback from people who use Linux on my recommendation, they do prefer it to look like Windows and Whereas people, generally speaking, especially those willing to move across to Linux, uh, do um, have an incentive, do have uh, are more likely to um, to be willing to learn, you know, new ways of doing things. You still want to keep as much similar as possible. And to be honest, if you ask me, and it's just my humble opinion here, I think you know Microsoft cracked the UI conundrum in you know like the late nineties. I think I think we've we hit peak desktop design there, and now everything else should ought you know should ought to be focused on apps. Really, that I I don't see a significant way that we have improved the traditional you know gnome uh, the traditional well the traditional uh, Windows layout, which can of course be reasonably em easily emulated in Mate uh, or XFCE or LXDE or KDE. So. Um, for the most part, you know, GNOME, if they're going to do what they're going to do and they're going to come, you know, come out of left field and do a, a lot of interesting UI changes, and I'm really talking about GNOME 3 in general now, they better be on the money and they better be on the ball. And I do like certain things. I do like the, the array of uh, open windows you get. I do like how they do multiple desktops without it having to take up too much in, you know, screen real estate. I do like the... Uh, the fact that you can get a, just a big dashboard of all you know all your all the things you need just by going into the top left hand corner um, a lot of people praise it for the for the add-ons and yeah like the fact that it is quite modifiable in that regard is to its credit but to be honest a lot of the the third party mods that you get for gnome 3 can be done natively in in most other desktop environments so you're getting you know it does have extensive um, third party add-on framework however um a lot of other distributions don't need such a don't need to rely on such a framework and then you never know when no might do a, another drastic change which makes more of their plugins um incompatible and themes incompatible which we have seen uh numerous times through just the gnome 3 cycle so and there are I, I, it didn't it has never crashed on me on on, on this antergos build but it gnome does crash on a lot of other people's builds so I gotta say, at a time when we're looking at all these new distributions coming towards GNOME, particularly of course with Ubuntu and Unity, um, and I was really quite excited about this. Um, I don't know, just running GNOME on a lower end laptop just really sort of made me see, made me benefit how well put together other desktop environments are. Um, 
even as well, moving the uh, cursor, and again, this is a this is a small UI issue, but it is something that I tend to find uh, is worth looking at, is um, to open up the dashboard, you have to move the cursor into the bottom left-hand corner, at uh, the top left-hand corner, which I'm not entirely sure is the most intuitive way, maybe the bottom left or, to the le or, or just somewhere to the left. Like some people have said to me, one of the things they really like about Unity is that the, the left align um, buttons uh, just work really well. And I did find that that to be very much the case with the Unity desktop, that the left line buttons work really quite well. And um, uh, and without actually dash to dot, the dash to dock add-on, which does a similar kind of functionality in GNOME. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, 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 I guess... I guess where, where you know the, the, there are lots of benefits to GNOME on the laptop, like the fact that you just need to push the window key to get that dashboard up. Um, it, they're noteworthy, but um, I think in anticipation, I anticipated these to be a greater benefit than they are. The, the, to be honest, with a desktop environment, you just want to use it and, and for it to get out of the way. And I think GNOME does try to do too much with bringing in, you know, you can log in with your Google account for crying out loud. And a lot of us move to Linux to get away from that kind of stuff. Yes, the integration is actually really fantastic to Google accounts. It, it syncs your calendar and your mail and all that kind of stuff. But I don't think that it's necessarily for me. And I think that GNOME at this point is sort of having maybe even a bit of an identity crisis or at least the application of GNOME. And this is what we're seeing with, with Ubuntu and Unity because um, now that Ubuntu have ditched Unity, it also seems to be the case or it seems to look like the case that Unity are moving more towards the developer and enterprise market, uh, which is freeing up the traditional home desktop user of Linux to other distributions. And we've heard of Pop OS, which really just strikes me as being a bit of a reskin of Ubuntu and there are pros and cons to doing that. Um, the pro being that, well, you, it's still you, uh, Ubuntu, but you have, you know, you, you get to build your own branding and um, you get to make sure that it works on your laptops your way. But then again, what we don't want is each laptop vendor having its own entire operating system. So, and, and, and people probably, I don't know if they'll get the nuance between one operating system and another. They may get that because of uh, nuances between mobile operating systems and what have you. But I think for a, for a lot of, you know, in a lot of cases, um, when it comes to, uh, the the various different Ubuntu operating systems, I think that there could very well be a case of like um, people not you know not not having any kind of sense of continuity through through their introduction into Linux. So obviously, I'm going to be doing a video on Pop OS another day, but uh, it is interesting to see that. Uh, it, it you know it does seem to have been brought out and invented for the sole reason of dealing with this identity crisis that Ubuntu and the Linux desktop are having right now. Ubuntu used to be the go-to desktop for every user, but now that Canonical and Ubuntu seem to be shifting their focus more towards the enterprise, possibly developer market, that does free up uh, the market for the more casual home user that um, you know you might expect to use Elementary or Linux Mint. And then you've got another Pop OS being thrown into the mix. Um, I think that it could very well end up being the case that um, they, people could have trouble following, you know, Linux in general because it's becoming just so fractured now. Um, and it always has had that issue of being, you know, have, of having lots of, of um, distributions and desktop environments and lots of choice and having to be sort of reasonably well informed to be able to make all of these conscious decisions in the knowledge of all the options available to you. Um, and that has always been a problem in Linux, but now it seems to be a problem that is multiplying because, um, yeah, Pop OS, that's a great way for System76 to control the brand. And what I mean by that is if, for example, uh, Ubuntu decide to make another drastic change, and this is going to be one of many drastic changes they've made over the few years, that make it so that... Um, boxing System76 laptops with Ubuntu would just become completely unfeasible. Um, then they could then base their Pop! OS on a different back-end operating system, while at the same time keeping the branding, have to do a lot less expl explaining to the customers as to why this has changed, why that has changed. They can use the same desktop environment. They've got their choice of desktop environment. They can maintain it with third-party plugins that they them themselves maintain. So is that first or second-party plugins or whatever you want to call it. So 
I can understand Pop OS from System76 point of view, but if they don't make it an operating system that can then be deployed everywhere else, and uh, it, you know it needs to be an operating system that extends beyond the reach of their hardware, then you know that could be a real p positive benefit for them, both in terms of their uh, marketplace and both in terms of the Linux community having a replacement for Ubuntu on the home desktop. One way you might, you know, you're your household gaming machine, perhaps you might want decent selection of programs. So you want it built based on something quite mainstream and quite widely uh, supported as well. Um, it does also uh, concern me that um, with Pop OS, they're going to have to support Pop OS entirely differently to, to Ubuntu. Ubuntu has a collective pool of support, which is one of the uh, the fact that it has such a large community, and since there's so much documentation for it in just so many places on the internet, that is no doubtedly part of its its success. And again. Pop OS might manage to raise the funds to overcome these problems, but they're fun. But they're problems that um, that you either need a strong community or a lot of money to deal with, and uh, we'll see where it goes with that. But anyway, enough of that particular tangent. Uh, another thing is that because I'm testing this on a laptop and it is my secondary machine. Um, the fact that it's a rolling release and that you have to download and install so many updates for it made it somewhat. Um, uh, more difficult than it needed to be just to have it as a secondary operating system or a, a primary operating system on a secondary machine. It meant that every time I booted it up, it was always asking for updates and usually they weren't that small. They were upwards of 60 megabytes a day. And um, if you don't have a particularly decent internet connection, that's um, that's going to get in your way. I'm not necessarily saying it's a show-stopping problem, but if you can then pull out a distribution of Ubuntu that only that needs a significantly smaller updates and also at the same time is just upgraded uh, in bulk, you know, you do you do your you do your your full system upgrade uh, once every other six months or or every uh, two or three or so years. So uh, and that requires a lot less maintenance. And for a secondary machine where you might not necessarily need the latest and greatest software, that might be a much more preferable. Uh, workflow option and it probably would be for me so um, when it comes to you know having a primary gaming machine um, uh, then you know a rolling distribution like Antergos makes a lot more sense because the latest and greatest software can can be used to take advantage of the latest and greatest features in hardware and you've got a great gaming or movie editing rig or something to you know something that requ requires horsepower in your machine uh, rolling releases tend to uh, come into a you know come to their strength there. But with your entry-level laptop um, that you just want as a second machine to check email, uh, do some typing up on, um, test distributions on in this case, then it is um, a lot of maintenance um, for, for just that. So I, you know, I, 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 in terms of, you know, my personal uh, time flow and commitment and all that kind of thing, I would not want to run a personal um, computer of any type, more than one personal com computer on a rolling release. I, I think it would just start um, pulling down, you know, too much bandwidth, too much time, too much effort for something that you wouldn't get the return on. There's usually only one machine or one place I need to be to actually, um, you know, do the kind of jobs that require the kind of horsepower that is taken advantage of by the uh, latest and greatest software of a rolling release. So I would say that Antergos is not a distribution suitable for beginners. It's not uh, a good first distribution if you're coming to Linux for the first time. It does require uh, knowledge of how Linux operating systems work. It does require a degree of confidence in, um, you know, sort of like searching for packages and things like that. Things aren't necessarily going to be completely obvious in the way that they might be with Ubuntu distributions or something like Linux Mint, which tries to make the specific effort to be uh, a little bit easier to, to transition. So it is a distribution for people who are comfortable on Linux um, operating systems, but it does take a lot of the um, sort of the sharp edges of, of Arch off. But that being said, like I, you know, I go back to the criticism of having just so many downloads or so many updates to actually have to download. If you had a an Arch distribution that you put together and you knew exactly what packages were on it, um, and it was very very small, you would obviously then have much you know fewer packages to maintain, much less to maintain, much choice over what gets maintained, and um, and thus have a much more leaner and faster operating system. But again, that takes time, and is that the kind of time you know like would you rather be doing something else with that time, or would you rather be tuning tuning your machine? Some people prefer column A, some people prefer column B. So um, Arch is a good, or um, Antergos rather, is a good middle road for that. It's like if you want the benefits of Arch but you don't want to put in the time, then, you know, uh, that's 
possibly uh, a road to go down. It's a big shame about the Intel Wi-Fi cards. I didn't follow it through to finding a complete solution. Uh, at that point, I just used a wired connection because it was easier and a shortcut. But um, and and it did seem somewhat accepted by the support that I went, um, went you know, uh, that I that I that I looked for. It did seem somewhat obvious that this was a perennial problem. This is just, yeah, you know, this is just. It's it's just there, <laughs> basically. It, it it seemed to be um, uh, something that people were, were already quite familiar with. So uh, overall, probably not the one that I would use for a laptop. But um, I, you know, Antergos does seem much more geared towards a desktop uh, type of environment. Um, and also, I got to say, using GNOME on an entry level laptop, GNOME looks and feels great on fast machines. But seeing it now on a on an entry level laptop does kind of make me appreciate how you know distribution or how desktop environments like XFCE and Mate are put together. Just a little bit, um, a little bit, uh, you know, they're, they're they're more lean, they're more faster, they're snappier. They require less noise system resources, and they don't have animations that uh, you know if if you're pushing to run it on hardware, then reduce the uh, the number of frames per second you're getting um, that, that then just make it look you know like with uh, with GNOME in. Um, in Antergos and running that, you know, sometimes it would slow down to what looked like 15, 20 frames per second on some of the animations and that. That just didn't look good. It looked, you know, like, like Marte and XFCE would look better. So anyway, that's just a few thoughts running Antergos. Again, apologies for not doing a screencast video, but I'm sort of explaining my experiences, if you know what I mean, rather than just sort of giving you a feature demonstration. Um, so, I, you know, there isn't wholly too much point in it, or there isn't too much for me to share with you today anyhow but yeah uh, that's about it for me today thank you very much for watching uh, until next time i've been chris ware and you've been awesome take care now